is Mike Dayton. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm outside the Judicial Building in Des Moines, Iowa. It is near downtown and right across from the Capitol. It's quite blustery out, so again, I hope you can hear me okay. But I am here on uh, September the 3rd of 2020 to interview Justice Matt McDermott. So I'll be headed inside to do that now, but wanted you to see the beautiful building and just sits up here on a hill. It's quite lovely, across from a lot of our government buildings, including the Capitol. Thanks. I'm in the rotunda of the Iowa Judicial Building. It's very beautiful. Great photo on this wall here. Really is worth coming to see sometime if you get a chance. This is Mike Dayton. I'm here with Justice Matt McDermott today, and we are in the library of the Iowa Judicial Building uh, across from the Capitol. Hopefully you can see the Capitol in the distance. And I'm just going to ask him a few questions today. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. So can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself as a person? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Carroll, Iowa. I'm the sixth of seven kids in my family. Uh, my dad sold feed to livestock farmers, and my mom uh, was a clerk in a local store there. I went to Iowa for undergrad from 1996 to 2000. Um, I went to law school at University of California, Berkeley, and graduated in 2003. I uh, came back to Iowa and um, practiced uh, at the Bellin Law Firm from 2003 until 2020. Uh, in uh, late 2019, um, Chief Justice Katie passed away and I put my name in for uh, a spot on, on this court. Um, there's a judicial nominating commission that, that winnows the list down to three names. I was one of the names that that went through and then the governor selects from those three names. I didn't get picked uh, the first time, but after my name got through, um, another justice retired. And so they had that process started all over again. And uh, I was again, one of the three finalists and the governor picked me the second time. Uh, so I got a phone call from her on, uh, on April 2nd of this year. So that's when my, my term officially started, but I had to wind up my my practice, and so I started with this court on April 27th. So it's whatever it is now, uh, early September. I've been doing this a little over four months. Uh, I have I live in West Des Moines. I have three kids, as as you know, um, ages seven, nine, eleven. I'm married. Uh, my wife's name is Heather. She works for principal, uh, and so uh, I'm enjoying this new job and. Um, uh, still kind of getting my, my sea legs a little bit on it. Well, that's great. Thank you. Well, thanks for telling us all that. So, in your words, what what do you think about the court system in Iowa? How, how does it work? Um, so, the court system uh, helps solve problems, in essence. Um, and it, very broadly speaking, deals with um, kind of two types of cases, civil cases and criminal cases. And in, in, in criminal cases, of course, you have this, the state uh, that is the prosecutor and is trying to do justice, and typically that means by, by proving crimes. Uh, in the civil context, you have private litigants, largely, um, who are trying to resolve disputes uh, that they otherwise couldn't get resolved, and so they're, they're coming to the, to the court system. Our system has multiple levels, and so it's kind of a multi-step you know, process. Typically, it starts in one of our district courts. We have 99 counties, obviously, and strangely enough, in the 99 counties, we have 100 courthouses. There's one county that has two courthouses. Uh, but each, each, court, each county has a, a district court, and that's typically where the, where the opening kind of line is in our, in our system. Uh, if the litigants disagree with what the district court does, and it could be a judge, it could be a, a, a jury, uh, they can appeal it. And all appeals in this state um, 
come to this court, the Supreme Court, um, and we decide whether we're going to retain the case or whether we're going to transfer it. And each year we get, roughly speaking, about 2,000 appeals that come to this building. Um, the Supreme Court typically retains about 100 or so of them, maybe 115. The rest go to the Court of Appeals, which are on the third floor of this building. And so they handle the bulk of those cases. The Supreme Court typically hangs on to cases that are in kind of, generally speaking, one of five categories. We hold on to cases that have constitutional issues or statutory issues that we think we need to weigh in on um, matters of first impression. So if there hasn't been a case like that previously, we'll deal with it generally. Um, if there are cases where there's a lot of disputes among either the district court or the court of appeals and a prior decision of ours, we will jump in and try to clarify that. Uh, we typically handle cases of attorney discipline. So um, any instance of, of a lawyer that would be suspended for misconduct, we handle all of those. And I guess kind of more generally, we handle matters of broad public importance. So um, that typically makes up the crux of the of the cases that that the Supreme Court takes on. And like I said, in a typical year, there's maybe about 115 of those cases. Um, we you know have different standards of review when we review cases. Um, there's, you know, kind of at the lowest level, the rational basis test at the sort of other end is strict scrutiny. And the review process uh, can turn a great deal on the level of, of scrutiny that the, the, the underlying case gets. Thanks. You know, you're using a lot of key terms that are becoming familiar to the students. So I really appreciate that. So, uh, Describe the Supreme Court and your position on it um, relative to other justices, and also just kind of what, what's your what's your normal day like? So the Supreme Court has seven justices, so I'm one of seven, um, and obviously there's an odd number there, um, and for good reason because you know we want to decide cases, and we we recognize that the cases that we decide, while they might have sort of broader legal issues that we're talking about or trying to kind of put put down um, these are real cases for real people and typically we we try to resolve the issue in that case and not sort of go go beyond it um, we work together but we're from all over uh, so i work in this building because i live in 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 polk county but we have justices from Cedar Rapids, uh, we have a justice from Davenport, a justice from Harlan, a justice from Ackworth, and then there are, are three of us here in, in Polk County. Those justices typically work in, the, in their home courthouse. So the Davenport justice, Justice Waterman, uh, typically works there. Now, the other justices come here for meetings, oral arguments, things like that, uh, but we're, we're spaced out. Um, and I think that that's a, a, a good thing. Um, we do a lot of emailing, we do case conferences, things like that. My day is primarily spent reading, so reading briefs that the parties file, uh, researching, so researching our prior cases, researching you know law review articles, other commentary, um, and then talking to my law clerk. Each, each, each justice has one law clerk that we work with that we you know, assign help with and largely in, in researching. Um, and then we talk to each other about kind of what our vote is going to be on those cases. Typically, one justice is assigned writing for any one case. So of the 115 cases in, in any given year that, you know, that, that we might be part of, we still vote on all of them unless we have a conflict that would require us to recuse in that, in that case. So, you know, I might write, generally speaking, kind of one seventh of the opinions in any given year, but I might dissent on a case. So I'm also writing on that, or I might uh, 
specially concur on a case, which means that I agree with the result, but I have a different method of analysis as to how I how I get there. Um, and so, you know, a, a justice might actually wind up writing, you know, maybe 20 to 40 different times throughout the course of the of the term, even though. Um, you know, we're we're still voting on 115 or kind of whatever that 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 number is. Uh, our our duties, I think, are generally split among three or four different things. The biggest and most important thing is deciding cases, so research and writing on the cases that come before us. But as I mentioned earlier, we also um, have kind of first crack at every case that comes here, but we don't take all of them. So we also have to decide which cases we're going to take on. So we wind up reviewing uh, a fair number of briefs that come in or uh, cases that the Court of Appeals handled that one of the parties disagrees with, which they can then appeal back to us. So it's called further review. Um, and if we, if we um, take one of those cases, from them, then, then we'll ultimately wind up deciding that case also. So writing cases, deciding what cases we're going to take, attorney discipline, we handle all of that. And then the kind of fourth area is the more administrative aspect. The, the Supreme Court is sort of like the board of directors for the judicial branch. So all of the rules, all of the civil procedure rules, criminal rules, um, ethics rules. We oversee all of that. We oversee the budget for the judicial branch. So, uh, you know, everything involved in running 99 uh, counties or 100 courthouses, we have to oversee. So all of the clerks, all of the personnel, uh, all of the, the district court judges, um, uh, we are oversight for all of that also. But the the main thing that we do is, is is decide cases. Wow, it sounds like a lot of work. It can be. It can be. We have a lot of help. I mean, we have a lot of staff to help us with that. We have clerks. We have staff lawyers here uh, that help us, you know, winnow cases and look at cases and and research cases. Um, it is a lot of work, and it can be a lot of pressure, especially with high profile cases where there's uh, obviously a lot of eyeballs on it, but um, you're treating every case you know, with the respect that it requires, recognizing that for many litigants, you know, it could be the only time that they're ever in a courthouse involved with our, with our system. And you want everyone to know and understand that they've had a fair shot and that we've looked at, you know, all of the arguments that they've made and um, have, have decided cases based on what the law requires of us. Good. Um, so, Justice McDermott, you are relatively new to the court, but have you seen anything uh, that has changed with the court or with the legal profession because of the pandemic? The pandemic pretty much um, shut down most, most in-person hearings uh, for a period of several months, from about mid-March until uh, late June, um, other than emergency hearings, uh, most hearings w switched to being conducted by Zoom or by a go-to meeting. Uh, and so, um, you know, as a, as a general matter, the, the standard operation that, that courts had typically been been using had to adjust and frankly just like every every business has also um, we have been moving toward restarting all of those things uh, in person hearings but also jury trials and uh, I was involved in a task force pretty much from the I think the second week that I was on this court um, uh, I was assigned to to co-chair the task force on restarting jury trials in this state. I came from a private practice where I was doing jury trials, so it was sort of a natural fit for me, but from a completely different angle. And so we did a lot of research into, you know, all of the protocols that we would have to put in in place. 
recognizing that particularly with a jury trial, we're not like, you know, a, a grocery store or a department store where if you want to go there, you can choose to go there. When you get a jury summons, you have to show up. And so because of that, we had to make sure that we were putting in place all of the protocols that were you know, that 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 were necessary to try to keep folks safe while also trying to balance the right that people have to a fair trial right and so there were some you know maybe different aspects to it that we had to kind of take into account that um uh you know brought into play how do we make sure that a defendant say in a criminal case is still getting a fair trial while everyone is you know wearing masks or everyone is socially distancing or, or or whatever it might be and so we put out a whole bunch of rules on that and we had a couple of uh i think we've had three pilot trials now where we've tested the new process so far it's worked very well and starting september 14th uh, the whole state is going to be going live with jury trials for the first time since March. What keeps you up at night? Sort of on that same front, um, obviously having been so closely involved in putting together the protocols for restarting jury trials, um, I, I would say uh, I have concerns or at least fears that um, jury trials become, you know, a, a COVID spreading event. We want to make sure, obviously, that that doesn't happen. But uh, I certainly do worry about that. And we're kind of constantly monitoring things out there. We have a lot of eyes and ears, you know, kind of telling us what's going on in particular counties or particular places. And so, you know, we're trying to keep up on all of that. Kind of more broadly speaking, um, you know, separate from the pandemic issues, which are obviously very big and and, and somewhat novel to us, um, I'm constantly, you know, worrying about, frankly, some of the same things that I worried about as a as a private practice lawyer, that I'm understanding, you know, all of the facts, all of the issues, that I have all of the the information on cases that I'm involved in, and so, um, you know. It's it's uh, a situation where almost with any case, you can always read a little bit more, right? You can always find another few cases. There are always you know, more rabbit holes that you can go down. And so, um, particularly as a as a new justice, I'm really trying to work hard on uh, just preparation as much as I possibly can for every single case. So I've got two more that I was thinking of. The first is, uh, from our earlier discussion, can a Supreme Court justice be called to serve on a jury? <laughs> uh, ironically enough, uh, yes, because we're citizens just like everybody else, and you know it's sort of a random draw. Uh, I am set to have my first oral arguments on this court the week of September 14th, and as I mentioned, that's, that's when the go-live date is for all of the counties in this state for resuming jury trials. I've been called to jury duty uh, on September 14th here in Polk County, uh, and so uh, that's where I'll be that that Monday. Uh, I've never been called for jury duty, but it, it's it's certainly ironic that uh, you know the the person that chaired the task force to put in place the protocols for resuming jury trials in the COVID-19 time period. Uh, and frankly, the person that you know helped draft the uh, you know, jury surveys for the people that are participating in those trials might actually be sitting on one of those trials. But I would look forward to it uh, if I if I have the opportunity to. So we'll just see where that goes. I guess you know you certainly can can be struck uh, from from uh, the list of of, of uh, folks that, that that might actually sit on a jury but I'll be there and uh, I'll be answering questions just like everybody else. What do you do for fun? Uh, I, I, I read for pleasure a lot. Um, what uh, sorts of things do you read for? Uh, so I typically, at, at any given time, I typically have a fiction book and a nonfiction book going. Right now, my fiction book 
is the second Harry Potter book. Uh, my my middle child, my son, is in Harry Potter right now, and he he wants to talk to me about it a lot and ask me to read it. So so I'm I'm going on the Chamber of Secrets um, and nonfiction books. Uh, I'm actually I read a fair amount of legal stuff in my in my spare time, and so um, I I'm I'm reading a book by a former Supreme Court justice named Oliver Wendell Holmes called. The Common Law. It was written in 1881, um, and uh, it's a pretty dense book. But uh, my 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 interest in books really run the gamut. So I have a lot of authors that I that I really like a lot. Um, Cormac McCarthy is a is a favorite of mine. Um, but uh, I I do like to read a lot of fiction, and nonfiction is you know, very random stuff. I um, I'm still kind of working through Bill Bryson's book on the body, but you know I, I'll read uh, you know, books on science, or books on astronomy, books on whatever it might be. I really try to kind of mix it up. I have a big list of books. Uh, if you came to my house and you saw my bookshelf, um, you would see a bunch of books that I haven't yet read that are sort of on a on a list. But in any event, um, I I run a fair amount. Uh, I do I do marathons. I run early um, morning. So this morning I was out um, uh, running. Uh, in I, I still go to a track. I used to run track in high school, so I, I still go to a track and run uh, a fair amount. Uh, a lot of kids sporting events, of course, as you well know, since we spent the summer together <laughs> at kids uh, softballs, uh, softball games. Um, so you know I'm playing catch or pitching or shooting hoops or whatever it might be. Uh, and then you know uh, I'm I'm uh, really kind of into music also. So I listen to a ton of music. I play music. I have a guitar. I play I play piano. So uh, I'm I would say those are kind of the things that consume my time when I'm when I'm not here. That's awesome. If you had I'll put you on the spot here. If you have one word of advice to the our, our undergrad students. Um, whether they're interested in law or not, um, whether they want to stay in business or not, what what would you tell? What would you tell a eighteen, nineteen, twenty year old right now? One word of advice. Um, one piece. Of one piece of advice. I think. Um, I would say um, there is a um, there's a a a notion out there, uh, and some have written on this that you, you need to sort of find that thing that really sings to you and kind of search for that. Um, I would say for me, a lot in my life, a lot of the things that I've done have been things that um, wasn't something that I found, that they found me. And so to be open to saying yes to things, uh, and there is one bit of, of advice out there that, that says up to a certain point in your life, say yes to everything. Just say yes to everything. and. I got involved in in a whole lot of activities and met a whole lot of people by saying yes to things that I never had any sense at the time. I never would have planned to do, but when asked to do it, I said yes to do it, and that spurred on meeting more people and doing more things and uh, a lot of involvement that had I that's I think made me a lot more you know well-rounded than I ever would have been and so I would say um, and uh, maybe sounds flighty but uh, being open to saying yes to things that that you typically maybe wouldn't but that when the opportunity comes just say yes it's wonderful advice well thanks for joining us today that was, uh, that was terrific and we really appreciate it thanks for your time thank you